Welcome to Dodgers Dogs as part of the Dodgers Daily Network. Casey Porter here. So glad that you decided to tune in. Hey, fans, this is a time where the Dodgers definitely have their back up against the wall. We all know that. They've had their back up against the wall a couple of times this year, and they have come through. Dylan Cease tonight for the Padres versus a pitcher that has not been named. You would have to think it would either be a bullpen game, an opener, something like that. But however the Dodgers decide to name it or choose it or order it, you would have to think that Landon Knack will be the bulk inning guy tonight, a rookie. So when you look at it on the surface, the Dodgers down 2-1. to one. You're in a crazy environment at Petco. The Padres are on the top of their game right now. And the Dodgers are back in kind of that rut to where they don't score and drive in runs unless they hit home runs. And so it looks bleak, I'm not going to lie. It looks like a situation that is hopeless. But again, the, the, the series is not over. Otani can get hot. Mookie Betts can get hot. Will Smith can get hot. And then last night, you know, you didn't use a lot of your, your, your A-team bullpen and then even the guys you did use, you didn't use a whole lot. So the Dodgers will be loaded for bear with all of their bullpen arms tonight. So what Landon Knack needs to do, if he is the bulk inning guy tonight, is just give the Dodgers a, a chance to get to the bullpen like they did last night, like Walker did, just, just down one run, no runs, whatever. Then the Dodgers have to figure out a way to score. So that's the beginning of the show right there. But going to get real with this, and I'm going to be honest with you, <clears throat> watching the Padres play, Jerks and Profar is mouthy, no doubt about it. Fernando Tatis is mouthy. Manny Machado gets underneath your skin. All of that kind of stuff. But to be honest with you, the baseball purist inside of me, I enjoy watching the Padres play. There is a weird side of me. Of course, it sucks that it's the Padres that are doing it. But the baseball purist in me, there's a weird side of me that kind of enjoys the fact that the style of game the Padres are winning with is actually successful in 2024. When you hear all of these tournament ball guys talk about you have to hit home runs. Of course, Tatis did hit the home run last night, but that's not how the inning was developed. They already had four runs by the time that happened. And by the time you've already scored four runs, the at-bats get easier. There was no pressure on Tatis at that point. And then that's when you actually do hit the home runs because everybody has momentum, everything's become contagious, and the next thing you know, bang, you run into one. So the baseball purist to me enjoys watching that style of baseball where you hit the ball up the middle, you put the ball in play, you play team baseball, and there is no denying when you watch the Padres play – they have each other's backs. They are playing for each other. They are the definition of a brotherhood. There is When you become a San Diego Padre on this team, whether it be David Peralta or, or Luis Arise, guys like that that they've acquired, okay, or even a Tanner Scott, you become one of the brothers. They have a great, tight culture However that goes, I think obviously the Profars and the Tatis and the Machados give them the perception of being punks like that. But really when you get down to it, what the Padres do is they just play a great brand of baseball. They play great baseball. They pitch well. They have a great bullpen. They play good enough defense. Sometimes they play great defense and they hit like crazy. And then another thing the Padres do if you're Walker Bueller and you get a pitch clock violation, then all of a sudden it's 2-0. They're, they're all-star, superstar type player like Manny Machado is okay with just lobbing a base hit up the middle to get things started. And so they have an approach that just get on, get over, and get in. So I say that to say once you get on the hook and they start a rally, they finish their rallies for the most part. You know, like we saw the Dodgers. Of course, Tommy Edmond hit the ball hard the other day with, the, with the, the line out. But so many times we see the Dodgers leave runners in scoring position. The Padres, they just bounce a six-hopper to the shortstop two or three times. They hit a 
five degree line drive that gets past Freddie Freeman. They lob a ball into center field and they don't let you off the hook because once they get first and third, nobody out, at least one run's going to score, probably two runs, because probably what the next guy's going to do is hit a ground ball that advances the runner from first to second and scores the run. And then they're just going to get a base hit up the middle and then they're going to score two runs. And then they just, like I said, they just don't let you off the hook. So I love their brand of baseball. I love their style of baseball. I wish it wasn't the Padres. But again, in some ways, the baseball purist of me is glad to see that style of baseball proving all these sabermetric advanced analytics dudes wrong. They're proving them wrong. The style of the Padres, the way that they're playing offense, is beating the Dodgers who struck out nine times last night, hit two home runs, so they had six hits. Four of them came in one inning. Two of them were home runs. And they got beat by the Padres, who struck out four times and pounded out, I think it was, 12 hits and played what some people would call an old-school style of offensive baseball like they've done all year. I don't call it old school. I don't call it new school. I think it's exactly exciting from a baseball perspective, not the fact that it's the Padres, from a baseball perspective that I think almost everybody would have to admit, as you watch it, it's not new school or old school. It is right school. It's a winning school of baseball. So from that perspective, uh, it's going to be very difficult to beat the Dodgers. I am not going to blow smoke. The Dodgers have not even listed their starting pitcher tonight. Dylan Cease, I do think he's gettable. I think he's a guy that the Dodgers, if they have a good game plan against, I thought the Dodgers did a good job against Michael King last night, as we told you on Dodgers Dogs as part of the Dodgers Daily Network yesterday. Out of his first 12 pitches last night, six of them were sweepers. He threw nine sinkers or, or uh, nine sweepers or sliders, left turns out of his first 18 pitches. And he threw a left turn, slider, or sweeper in 11 of his first 23 pitches. It was all about laying off the sweeper that wasn't in the zone like Will Smith didn't do. That's why Will Smith swung through his and struck out early, which is uncharacteristic of him. That's what Shohei Otani didn't do, which is why he struck out. But it is what Mookie Betts and Teo Hernandez did do. They both saw the starting points of the sweepers they got. Teo Hernandez specifically got a hanger. Mookie Betts has started more on the inner half of the plate, which which indicated to him it's not going to break off the outer half. They saw the starting points. They ambushed the pitches, the, the sweepers that were in the zone, and because of that, they made good passes at the ball and both hit home runs. So, really, I thought the Dodgers were hit and miss. I thought the hit allowed them to get, the obviously, the two home runs between Hernandez and, and Betts, but it also was a little bit miss in the sense that they weren't able to generate anything other than the third inning because they were chasing and swinging at some pitches, I thought, early on that they definitely uh, probably should have been laying off if they had a little bit more discipline in that scenario. And that's one thing that the Padres do is that they just they just continue to put pressure on you, like the second inning for the Padres. First of all, we mentioned it a minute ago, you have the pitch clock violation. Manny Machado then comes up and lobs one into center field. And here's the deal on him, the ground ball to first base with Freddie Freeman. Very disappointed, okay? You get caught up in the moment and you get a ground ball like the Miguel Rojas deal, the Freddie Freeman deal, and I know this may be very high schoolish to say, but you got to get the first out first. Worry about getting one out. Then if you can turn to double play, that's icing on the cake. I thought both Freddie Freeman and Miguel Rojas were too double play oriented. I think if they would have thought, just get one out. Just get one out, and then we'll see what happens from there. That would have been a much better approach. Of course, Freddie Freeman has to throw from his knees. And then Manny Machado... Here's the deal on that rule, is that whatever base, baseline, base, the path that you set, 
So like your starting point, and then as you run towards the next base, whatever straight line that is, you have three feet on either side of that path that you chose for yourself before you become out of the baseline. And so I think when you look at the path that, that Manny Machado started on, I think he was squarely within that three feet. And, and having said that, I think that was a good job by him. I think Freddie, to be honest with you, needed to guarantee whatever he had to do to make sure and just get the one out. Don't hurry things up trying for double play. Then the next thing you know, you don't have any outs. Miguel Rojas, the same situation. I think he felt like if he went and touched the bag, that gave him the best chance to get rid of the ball the fastest and then turn the double play at that point. Whereas if you just flip it to Gavin Lux, you get the one out, you you, you just kind of let the chips fall where they may as to whether you can get the second out or not. And because the Dodgers, I thought, hurried up and, and, and tried to, to uh, just – they tried to, to turn two instead of getting the one out right there. Uh, they, uh, they, they really paid for it. And then whenever you, you make mistakes against the Padres, like we said earlier, they are not going to let you off the hook. And then Fernando Tatis finished it off. But you got to be very proud of the Dodgers, who have been resilient this year. They get a couple of base hits. Otani breaks his bat, hits one up the middle, kind of right center. You started off with Miguel Rojas. He does a really good job, and then Mookie Betts gets his second hit, of which you're thinking, hey, Mookie Betts is it's finally back, right? Now he can settle down. He's liable to like go off and go four for four or five for five, something like that, of which obviously we didn't see. But Mookie Betts gets the hit, and then Teo Hernandez hits the hanging sweeper, and now you're thinking, okay, well, we've made it all the way back. And at that point, I, I would have given you a lot of money that the Dodgers – we're going to come back and win because if you remember our show yesterday, the, the map that we gave you was that Walker Buehler hands the ball over being down just one run or somewhere within that vicinity to make it a bullpen game with at least four or five innings left for the Dodgers to get to the Padres' bullpen. But they just didn't do it. And I think probably the most disappointing aspect of that both in the sixth and the eighth innings, you had it perfectly set up. I mean, you know, a lot of times you're a leadoff hitter, but you only lead off one time a game. That's like your first at bat. Otani got to lead off three times last night. And I know he got the, 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 the base hit in the four-run third inning. So don't think that I'm throwing shade or anything. I'm just trying to state a point that if the Dodgers are going to beat the Padres – you can't have Otani, Betts, and Freeman come up both in the sixth and the eighth inning and go three up, three down, and not really put even not even not not only do you not score, you just don't even put any pressure on the Padres whatsoever. So uh, that to me last night, yeah, you know, hey, I thought I thought that the uh, the 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 two parts of it that were the most disappointing were that two veterans. I thought they, they got a little bit too aggressive and didn't take the one out. That cost the Dodgers. It almost felt like they were making decisions defensively like, man, we can't afford to even give up one run. You know, that's where that, that kind of that panic right there, that's when you end up giving up the six instead of just the one. If you just take the outs, just take the outs, you give up three runs instead of six, and the Dodgers win last night, right? Just take the one out. So I thought that was disappointing there and then I thought that the second most disappointing, probably maybe the most disappointing part of it, was the fact that you had two chances with the top of your lineup in the sixth and the eighth inning, and you did absolutely nothing about it. And then obviously, Will Smith, Max Muncie. I, I I've said it many different times. I can't stand it when Teo Hernandez and Max Muncie are back to back in the lineup because so many times you're just going to get empty at bats from them. I know Teo hit the Grand Slam, so I don't mean that as a criticism. I just mean it to be real. Yes, the Grand Slam's great, but the empty at-bats aren't, right? And then Max Muncy's not hitting. He strikes out a lot. So when you have Teo and Max back-to-back, -back, I just think they're too strikeout prone. Both of them are to where it makes innings too easy on a pitcher because they're, they, they strike a couple guys out back-to-back. -back. Then Will Smith is up with – two outs and nobody on, something like that. 
and that makes his at bat, you know, where where to where if he hits the ball a fly ball to right center, it doesn't matter. He actually has to hit a double or a base hit. He actually has to get a hit for that at bat to be productive. You know, one thing that that makes Will Smith a very productive is is whenever he's put in a position to where he doesn't have to get a hit to be. He can grind out a walk. He can hit a sack fly. He can move a runner because a lot of times he's capable of doing those things. But too many times he's coming up with two outs and nobody on. But point blank, Will Smith needs to get going. So uh, if, if, if Max Muncy and Will Smith don't get going – and then Freddie Freeman continues to be hurt. He got the he lined out the left field. That was that was a tough out. Although the, the Dodgers still scored all four runs with the home run behind it. But then he got the base hit later. So I think Freddie Freeman's being uh, having a good series. He's doing everything he can. But bottom line is, if the Dodgers are in position tonight, I'll, I'll put it to you this way: here's overall the disappointment of last night with the way things are set up right now. If the Dodgers are in position in both the sixth and the eighth innings to have Shohei Otani, Mookie Betts, and Freddie Freeman at the plate down just one run, I will take that all day and twice on Sundays. I will take that scenario. I will. I will. I. I just think that's a that that is a, not a terrible scenario for the Dodgers to be in. Now, obviously, it would be better if the Dodgers had the lead. No doubt about that. But. Uh, I think if you stay, there's a chance to where you come out here and and you get behind like the dot like that six spot that the Padres put on yesterday. They could easily do that in the first inning, right? Which buries you. We saw that with Kershaw last year. Then it just screws up your entire offensive game plan, and away you go. So it's important you don't do that. It's important you stay connected with the game, like you did last night. You just couldn't get after the third inning you just couldn't figure out a way and that part of that is because it was a boom and bust offense short of Miguel Rojas and Shohei Otani and Mookie Betts three hits there in the third inning the only runs that were scored last night were driven in through home runs the only runs that were driven in last night were driven in through home runs when the Dodgers get in that rut they go long periods of time where they have dry spells. It happens over and over and over, and I think we saw that last night. When they have to hit home runs to generate, when, they, when they're not generating rallies, when they're not drawing walks, when they're not stealing bases, when they're not gathering base hits, right? And instead, they're just having to hit home runs. That's where you see the boom and bust. That's where you see the three or four spot in one inning, and then six innings in a row where they don't score. And, I mean, to the Dodgers' credit, too, they did the same thing to the Padres, but the Padres had the lead. So they didn't have to be ultra-aggressive. And I kept thinking if the Dodgers could just get Tommy Edmond on base or Shoei Otani on base, you know, and the sixth or the eighth of Otani could have got on base, he could steal second, maybe even steal third, right? Because Agashioka is not good – at, at throwing down or that kind of thing. But give the Padres credit. The best way to keep somebody from stealing bases on you is to not let them on base to begin with. And then I was hoping that maybe Suarez, who has struggled lately, would come out and maybe not have his command. The Dodgers could feast on that, maybe get a runner or two, get him in the stretch, or not at least the stretch with a, a runner on base. And they're all in the stretch all the time now. And then just put pressure on them, you know, but – it just didn't happen. So it was disappointing for a lot of different ways last night. But having said that, waking up today, it is a new day. The series is not over. The Dodgers are, hey, I'm not going to blow smoke. The Padres are heavily favored to win one of the two. I even said it a couple days ago that the Padres are going to be heavily favored to win both of these games. I think as a Dodgers fan, that's kind of what I'm saying about being down just one when you turn it over the bullpen, having so many chances with your dudes up to win the game. That's all you could ask for last night. Because to be honest with you, the, the Padres had to be the big favorites last night. The same way they're going to be big favorites tonight. So if you have a chance to win the game, you, you got to take advantage of it. you you got to break through that door. It's also why... We see teams get right up to the mountaintop and they just can't climb that mountain. Getting over that hump is always a lot harder 
than actually trying to climb. And I've said many times in the first time I heard this stat, it kind of blew me away and I, I didn't quite even, I don't think I believed it, but it's kind of like whenever you buy a new car, then all of a sudden you notice all the other cars on the road that are like yours and you didn't ever notice. Like we got a Nissan Murano and we're like, I didn't realize there was this many Nissan Muranos on the road, right? Just because you start noticing them. But I say that to say so many times the team that wins the game scores more runs in one inning than the other team scores the entire game, which goes to show and and you'll see now you'll now that you've heard that stat, you'll start seeing it more like last night. But that what that really goes to show is that the team that capitalizes the most on their rally opportunities, especially in playoff games, especially in close games, is the team that wins. The Padres scored six in their rally. The Dodgers scored four. That was the difference in the game. So, hey, the, that, that's, that's how all that goes. The, the, the scary part of it for Dodgers fans, the depressing part, is you don't even know who the starter is going to be. You're facing Dylan Cease, who is very good. You're facing a very t- a tough Petco crowd. I think the the silver linings to it is you have a very, very fresh bullpen. You have a lot of experienced guys that can throw up a lot of zeros. You're not going to be asking for a Herculean-type effort from if it is Landon Knack as your bulk inning guy. You're just going to ask him to go maybe three innings, maybe only two innings, and just give up one, maybe two runs. Just keep the Dodgers within striking distance. That's all he has to do. He doesn't have to be perfect. He doesn't have to be great. Then turn it over to Evan Phillips, who I think can go multiple innings. I think Alex Vesia could go multiple innings. Ryan Brazier can come in and throw an inning, maybe have an up-down and throw an extra out. I think Blake Trinan could have an up-down and throw an extra out. We saw Michael Kopech. There's another silver lining. He threw well last night. So you have a very heavily rested bullpen with a bunch, I think you could cover 78 innings tonight with your bullpen and be fine and throw up zeros the entire time. If you're going to win, if you're wanting to look for the optimistic uh, part of tonight, the out- optimistic outlook for the Dodgers' sake, I think that would be it. I think you can rely on your bullpen. You don't have to ask too much of Landon Knack. And then Dylan Cease, I think, is gettable for the Dodgers. And you go score five, six runs. Your bullpen does what they do. Landon Knack gives up. Maybe a run or two, your bullpen does what they do, and you win the game 6-3, to 6-4. to four. That's the perfect roadmap for the Dodgers tonight. But you got to go out and do it. But all, I say that all to say, yes, the Padres, in my opinion, heavily favorites, but it's not over. So it's going to be super exciting tonight. It is 8 o'clock Eastern. That is 7 o'clock my time Central. That is 5 o'clock Pacific. It is going to be exciting. It is win or go home for the Dodgers we will have the conversation about just how disappointing this season is if that happens, but we will not have that conversation until then. So, hey, thank you for tuning in. Uh, this is this playoff run. Uh, hopefully it continues. Uh, Dodgers Daily continues to grow, and that is much thanks to everybody out there. I am just so thankful for everybody that has helped Dodgers Daily grow. So I want to thank everybody again for tuning in to another episode of Dodgers Dogs as part of the Dodgers Native Network. It's a great day to be a Dodger. Go Dodgers.